In this video, we are going to talk about Ricci curvature tensor. Ricci tensor is the first component that we encounter when we start learning Einstein's field equations and general theory of relativity. In my earlier videos of general relativity, I have not covered Ricci tensor much in details, but I have just touched base the overall idea. In this video, we are going to cover Ricci tensor, the geometrical properties, the mathematics of Ricci tensor and the underlying concepts, whatever is required to get this concept of Ricci tensor clear. In this video, we are also going to touch ahead with geodesic deviation, parallel transport, covariant derivative and certain concepts which are required to study Ricci tensor. Ricci tensor is by far the first and the most important concept of general relativity and this video covers in-depth details of this particular concept. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. I welcome you to my channel. My attempt has always been to explain difficult concepts in an easy manner because explanation in easy way by far is most difficult rather than explaining it into difficult, mathematical and other complicated ways. So let us first start, before we start with the video, what are the components and the factors that we are going to cover in this video. So what are the topics that we are covering? We will first start with Einstein's field equations, uh, a very important concept of why do we measure spherical objects. We also learn about tensors and their role. We learn about geodesics, uh, what is called volume change along geodesics, that is a fundamental uh, idea of this video. Linear transformations, uh, what is called a volume element, what is an area element and most importantly the concept of what is a volume form. We will take ahead volume form from orthonormal basis to non-orthonormal basis and different uh, basis like arbitrary basis and we will cover up the concept of volume form. We are also going to cover up parallels transport along with that what is a covariant derivative and finally what is a sectional curvature. Some part of the video you might already know, for example, linear transformation or volume area element, you can skip those parts. But I have kept it in this video because I always want to make my video one single video and it will cover up all the concepts required for the subject. You don't have to go anywhere other than uh, this video. However, in the I button, I have given the entire playlist of uh, uh, Einstein's field equations and general relativity which you can go through but if you want you can skip some of those elements which we already know however I am covering up so that you don't have to look in further details. Okay so first of all we start with our Einstein's field equations. Now in, when we talk of Einstein's field equations we talk about this particular equation and I will try to quickly give you an overview about what those components and signs are all about. First of all, we know that the left hand side of the Einstein field equation is basically the measure of the curvature of space time. That means how the space time is curved, and we all know that it is a curvature of space time that is called a manifestation of the space time uh, measurement, and that is what is called gravity. So, the measurement of the curvature of space time actually shows the entire structure or the geometry of space time. Whereas the right hand side actually is the matter energy content of space time, which means that how much matter is there and how do we measure the matter, which actually shows the matter movement. And both these terms are equal to each other. So we first learn the left hand side, which measures the curvature of space time, and then we go to the right hand side, which tells the matter movement. And both of them, the geometry of space time equals to the matter movement, and that is why the curvature of space time and gravity is being explained by Einstein's field equations. So, the left hand side is actually basically what is called measurement, and we are going to cover up this measurement factor taking into account the Ricci curvature tensor. Okay, so once again, the Einstein's field equations, this part is actually what we call is the Ricci curvature tensor. This tensor actually measures the volume of a matter that changes when it moves through flat space to curved space. We are definitely going to look and explore more on this. The next part is this one, ER, 
which tells that it is a Ricci scalar. Ricci scalar means it keeps track of how the size of a ball deviates from one place to another. Next, we come across the G, which has happened occur twice. That is called the metric tensor. And we know that metric tensor is basically a way of measuring distance and all the entire causal structure of space-time. The next part is called the Riemann curvature tensor. Our Riemann curvature tensor is actually a contraction of the Ricci curvature tensor. I have not mentioned it in red which part of the Riemann curvature tensor is. You can watch my earlier videos on general relativity where I have explained the Riemann curvature tensor and how it is contracted. The next one is the T part which is on the extreme right hand side and it is called the stress energy momentum tensor which as I have just explained shows the matter movement through space time. That means how the entire matter moves which has been explained in a, in a tensor format. So this covers up the Ricci curvature, the Ricci scalar, the metric tensor, the Riemann curvature tensor and the stress energy momentum tensor. This comprises of the entire Einstein field equations. However, the lambda, 8 pi, g and c raised to the power 4 are basically constants. The uh, gravitational constant, the cosmological constant and c to the power 4 is the speed of light which has been for calculations extended to the power 4 to keep the dimension analysis intact. Okay, now here is one question. Now, if you have noticed in Einstein's field equation, black holes, etc., we are always measuring spherical or circular structures. We are not measuring, apart from differential geometry, anything like a convex or a concave uh, shape or something which is rectangular. So, the immediate question that haunts our mind is that why do we measure spherical structures or circular structures? Now, if you see that in differential geometry and other areas, we always take a sphere or an oblate spheroid or a ball or something and we try to measure the line or the movement along that sphere and here in the oblate spheroid it extends up to a certain extent. Now the reason is that these are geodesics on uh, we sometimes calculate. We also calculate a point on a sphere. We also take into account the tangent planes. We also take neighborhoods which is a typical term for topology and what is called a unit sphere. So the question is that why do we always measure spheres and shapes like that? Now the answer lies that whenever we are talking of Einstein's field equation specifically, we talk of it on a cosmological scale, on a scale which uh, measures the movement of spherical celestial objects like Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, uh, certain black holes, etc. So the reason is that because most of the structures on a cosmological scale that we measure using Einstein's field equation are spherical in structure, for example, Earth, the Sun, the Moon or any other planet, the black holes, etc. So that is why we always consider spherical structure or measurements. And that is why you will see that in exact solutions of Einstein field equation, be it Schwarzschild metric or Schwarzschild black hole, we always try to keep uh, the measurements of spheres and that is why it is uh, the most of the Einstein's equations will consider sphere or a ball which has got a roundish say, shape and because the entire cosmological structures the units that we measure resembles those uh, shapes so that is why we always measure spheres. Now the thing is that it often comes into our mind is that what is Einstein field equation all about? Now, the Einstein field equation actually describes how energy and momentum which causes the curvature and the curvature itself is different by, uh, defined by different type of tensors which actually in terms builds the metric. So, uh, the Einstein field equation actually helps us to measure the energy momentum which is responsible for the curvature and the curvature is built up by the metric and Einstein field equation determines the metric depending on how matter is spread out through space time. The uh, fact is that field equations or Einstein's field equations are extremely complicated. I mean to say, uh, I will make a video which you will see that it is huge if you take only this one part of the uh, component. So if these are nonlinear second order partial different equations, and in most of the cases it doesn't, or it is very difficult to have an exact solution. 
Now, see for example, I will take an example of a person standing on the surface of the earth. Now, obviously, if we talk of the curvature, etc., then this person actually will cause a curvature while standing on earth. We take a heavier object, for example, this elephant sitting somewhere and it also causes the curvature. We also take into account these people who are standing on the surface of the earth and they also cause a kind of a curvature. Now, if you are talking of measuring of curvature through Einstein's field equations, so the question is that, can we use Einstein's field equations to calculate these type of curvatures? I mean to say the elephant or a man standing or people standing on the surface of the earth using the Einstein field equation. The answer is obviously yes, but the effects would be too small to notice because these do not carry that amount of effect which the Einstein's field equations are designed to measure. So, the reason I showed you is that that is why the spherical structures on a much more bigger, higher or cosmological scales are used to calculate uh, using Einstein's field equation. So, Jupiter, uh, the mass of the sun or a supermassive black hole, these would be very important in terms of calculating using Einstein's field equations. So, yes, we can use Einstein's field equations on our day-to-day -day basis to calculate the curvature or the spread out of the energy or momentum across this space-time, but the effects would be too small, negligible, that it won't carry any meaning. However, if you use these in a cosmological scale or things which are huge, which are mammoth, big in size, then definitely Einstein's field equations are going to yield the possible results. So, here is the Einstein field equation and we are here to talk about the Ricci curvature tensor which measures our volume change along geodesics. Okay, so the definition says that the Ricci tensor measures our volume in curved space differs from a volume in Euclidean space, right? Because Euclidean is a, a kind of a flat space where a curved surface is a curved surface and it also measures a volume be between geodesic changes due to curvature. Now, the question, if you take uh, precisely about this particular definition, then there are a few elements which we need to take care. First of all, when we talk of Ricci tensor, we need to know what is a tensor. Next, we talk about geodesics, so we need to know what is a geodesic. And third, the most important part is that we are talking about volume changes or the change of volume compared to that of Euclidean space. What do we mean by volume changes as it moves along? So, in the next part of the video, we will start one by one clearing up those elements so that the concept of Ricci curvature tensor is absolutely clear in front of us. Okay, so first we go and we need to understand why do we need tensors in general relativity. We are just going to touch base about the basic thing of tensor. Our tensor is a huge elaborative subject. So, what we do is that we take kind of a flat space. And we take a vector A, which is uh, which is in the flat space. And what we do is that we take the basis of the vector A y pointing in the y direction, and we take A x, which is pointing in the x direction. And this blue line actually calculate or uh, marks the basis of the vector in a flat space. Now, in a curved space, we plot the same x y, but we make it a kind of a grayish, say. A shade, and here are the curvilinear coordinates which we rename as x prime and y prime. The vector remains the same, which is a pointing in the same direction. However, the curves, uh, uh, the, the the basis of the vector is a prime x, and we call the basis of the vector a prime y. And then we try to calculate the basis of the vector by joining the blue lines. Now, what do you see from this kind of a uh, you know, uh, illustration is that the a prime x, which is much longer considered to the a x, which was in the flat space time, and a prime x we consider to be longer in the curved space. We also get a prime y, which is much longer considering the a y, which is in the flat space. But notice that a is invariant. So the basic idea of this particular illustration is that. Tensors are something or we are going to frame a kind of a mathematical tool where the, the vector would remain the same because otherwise the problem arises in terms of calculations. However, from flat to curved or any other coordinate system, the basis of the vector will change. 
Now, when we talk of the basis of the vectors in a curved space time, here I have measured t as time and x just for two dimension. However, if you want, you can imagine x as three dimension of time and one dimension of uh, three dimension of space and one dimension of time. Here is the curvilinear coordinate, and you will see I have just written that this e t and e x compared to this which we just saw saw, saw that the, the, these are the lines uh, in the flat space. So the basis vector t actually points in the time direction and basis vector x points in the x direction. And you can now see how the bases are changing. I have written as ux and by just to tell you that from ux to by how the basis vector is changing and this change is happening in curved space time. So right now if we talk from the flat space time where we use the dot product to uh, you know, calculate the basis of the vectors by dividing it into components. Here we cannot do that. We cannot do that for the simple reason that we are not in a flat space but in a curved space. The basic idea of this illustration is to give you the idea that we are forming tensors. The reason is that we are moving from curved space to the uh, curved uh, flat space to the curved space. We are taking this illustration as itself, and what we are trying to tell is that. Here we use something which is called a metric tensor, which is a kind of a correction factor. Why? Because each term in this dot product is to measure the basis vectors which might change from place to place. So here we cannot write because the basis of the vectors are not constant. Here you will see that this G11, G22, G33 is basically the metric tensor. And this metric tensor is a component of two index tensor rather than vector components and that is why we have two indices. Now if you are really interested to know much about metric tensor, I have a complete detailed video on what is metric tensor. You can find it in the playlist in the general relativity theory in my videos. So the, the basic idea of this part of the video is to let you know that when we are moving from the flat space to the curved space, we cannot write it using the dot product. However, we use the dot product and we introduce a small, you know, correction factor which we call metric tensor which is denoted by G. And this metric tensor is a tensor. So we devise this in order to measure movement along the curved space. As I told that it measures all the causal, causal structure of space time keeping the invariant nature of the vector. So here is the basis vector in curved space. This is how the movement happens. The basis vector in time direction and the x in the t direction. And you see that the uh, metric tensor is basically the dot product of the basis. So I can use it as gx dot gt because I have measured gx gt. But in most of the cases, you will find g mu nu. So mu and nu are basically the graphic, the indexes which measures the, which denotes the space time structure in Einstein's field equations. So the idea behind showing you this is that the basis vectors in curved space time are used using the dot product but using a metric tensor which gives us the correction factor. Now here is uh, another uh, Im important way to tell you is that uh, the general idea of tensor is not only that we are changing the basis from a flat space to curved space but there is something which is called a principle of general covariance. If you go to my playlist on fundamental concepts of general relativity part 1 and part 2, this part is dealt with much more in details. However, in this part of the video, I will just cover up the essentials of general covariance. So here is a person on a frame of reference who is throwing a ball. And here is the same person who is throwing the ball, but in a kind of a rotated axis, so the axis is rotated. So the principle of general covariance tells that both the events would be there and the events will measure in the same way in all frames of reference. Again, I will uh, make a kind note to the viewers that this rotation of axis or the elongation of axis, whatever has been demonstrated in this video is just for to get an idea. It is not strictly mathematical. However, so uh, uh, when we talk of covariance, we, are, we have seen one event which is taking uh, the same event in a rotated axis. So the principle tells that the event should be measured in the same way whatever be the frame of reference. So again this person is throwing a ball and this person is also again throwing a ball in the uh, doing the same event but here the axis has been extended. That means the, uh, the, the frame of references have changed. 
So again here the events will be measured in the same way as here in the uh, kind of a, a sphere you will see that this actually measures the, uh, the curvature or the red line but when we uh, stretch that sphere into an oblate spheroid this measurement becomes a little bit longer. So the basic idea of all those illustrations are that you, we need to measure the uh, we, we need to measure the events, whatever be the frames of reference, whatever be the structure or the topology which has been extended from spherical to oblate spheroid, as has been put up uh, famously by Einstein, that the general laws of nature must be identical, expressed identically equations relative to all other systems, whichever way they are moving. That means irrespective of whatever the frames of reference, irrespective of whatever is happening, we need to measure the events in the same way and that is the reason it is called covariance. That means it is varying with something with relation to a variable or something and that is the need of a tensor. So we need a tensor in order to measure the principle or to obey the principle of general covariance in order to measure events which are same in all frames of reference. So here is a basic fundamental idea that why do we need tensors? Because we need to create a mathematical model so that we can measure or we can predict the change that, that is happening in the space time, either in contravariant, that means opposite or in the covariant manner. So tensors are mathematical objects will help us understand transformational properties. Always it happens in the same coordinate system and whose components transform in a nice way. So these are a few of the important areas or the need for tensors in general relativity. However, with this tensor concept in our head, we are going to tackle the Ricci curvature tensor. So if the vector changes, there is a uh, there is a problem in measurement. So the vector, we have to keep it invariant. The next part is that we need to have the components of the vector. We have seen how the components of the vector changes from the flat space to invariant space. So we have to develop a method to measure them. And any mathematical entity which is invariant under rotation, this is just a, a rotation, but there can be a, other movements also. Anyway, under rotation of coordinate system is called a tensor. So these are few of the components. You can take a snapshot, you can pause the video and note it that these are the reasons that we should have a tensor. So why do we need tensors in general relativity? If you get this kind of a curvilinear coordinates and we get objects or balls, anything which has been spaced, uh, placed over here, you can see that the presence of mass causes the space time to distort in a way that the basis of the vector changes. So, here you can see that the red lines actually shows the curvature, one which is heavy has got a bigger curvature compared to that of the lesser. So, tensor are equations to retain the form as we change coordinate system because in tensors and general relativity, you deal with arbitrary coordinates, tensor is important. And it obeys the rule of diffeomorphism. Uh, I'm not explaining what is diffeomorphism right now. I have explained it earlier because again it will take time. Tensors, because of their transformational properties, are essentials and is uh, in writing gen generativity theory of equations. This is gives us an independent coordinate system, and you can just think of space time as a material which is undergoing a stress, and tensor describes the material stress strain. Again, it is not a very rigorous definition. However, it gives a kind of an intuitive understanding that how the mat matter energy content is being spread out over space time and the tensor describes the material strain, keeping the coordinates or the co uh, coordinate system which becomes independent. And because general relativity deals with arbitrary systems of coordinates, tensors are required. Here is a, just a note of caution which I would like to tell that uh, tensor by definition is not, they are not generalization of vectors or matrices. This is often a new uh, misconception which happens among students and learners. So what we can tell, can we tell that for example vanilla ice cream is a generalization of a desert? No, we cannot because vanilla ice cream is an ice cream, right? So the most of the time when we tell the tensors are uh, generalizations of vectors or matrices, it is just because they look like so. So for example, that we can say technically vectors are generalization of tensors. So once we take in the array of numbers, which are, uh, we can see right at the bottom of the screen, 
they result into a matrix and then result into a kind of a tensor. So because of the arrangement pattern, which becomes very easy for us to understand, we call tensors are some something analogous to vectors or matrices. But I would strictly, uh, you know, disagree to this point that they are not because just of the visualization, we cannot make a definition in physics or mathematics wrong. So we can define tensor as an algebraic object, as a multidimensional array. I would prefer to call them as a linear map. So mathematical objects that can be described to use physical properties and tensors defined mathematically are simply array of numbers. We can call that say it is in its simplest form is the quantity having magnitude, direction, magnitude and direction vector already have the speciality it has got a plane to act on uh, tensor quantities. So this is a note of caution. The uh, the way that we visualize or define tensors, they are not. They are multilinear maps, algebraic objects, multidimensional arrays, or you can call a quantity which have got a magnitude, direction, and a plane. Okay, so why do we need tensors in general relativity? Because they have for the basic postulate of covariance, and there is a way of measurement where all the laws of physics are the same. Remember that Einstein during his mature years was struggling to what we call a general covariant theory of gravity and that is why the tensors came into rule and you can lo uh, look into my video which is called tensors and their role in general relativity. I have given a much more detailed idea about how the tensors came from, what a tensor, the history of tensor, who first you coined the term tensor and the history of how Marcel Grossman and his friends Michel Besso introduced the concept of tensor in general relativity and thereby helped Einstein to construct his magnum opus general relativity. So I hope this till now the video is going fine. You can just subscribe and click on the bell icon to get all the notifications from physics from students. So we come to the next part of the video which is called a geodesic which is central and very important in terms of uh, general relativity. So first we are done with tensor which was one of the one of the element of the definition of re uh, Ricci curvature tensor. Now we go with geodesic. So if you get two points, uh, how do we travel from one point to another? It is the straight line. So even if we get a kind of an in a triangle like this and two points which are those black points, we will again take a straight line. Even if we get kind of a curved surface like that and we get two points, how do we travel? We travel in the straight line which curves a little bit in this fashion. Even if we get a curved surface like this, these two, two uh, black dots, we get a kind of a curved a curved line. So these are actually geodesics. So geodesics are simply the shortest path that a particle uh, uh, you know, undertakes. Here is a classic example. If you get a tram, and here is the path of the tram. And if you ask any physicist that what is the way in the train which the tram is going to travel, they will say that you give me the initial conditions of these. Uh, if the equation is a second order derivative, then if you can give me the two conditions, we use F equals to MA and then we can calculate. However, if you ask a rickshaw puller or the tram driver where it will go, it will say in this way. That means the path that is laid out in front of the tram. So in the, in one way what we can all these illustrations help you is that geodesics are simply the shortest path that a particle or a world line takes. So the tram will follow the shortest part that is which is laid down in front of it. So the straight line uh, coming from the straight line if you get into the curved space time curvature so we can say that it generalizes the notion of a straight line to curved space time. So this curvature, as we know, is gravity is due to the curved space time, and we can say that when an object moves through space time in a straight line geodesic, but if the space time is curved, obviously gravity is present. This line will follow the curvature and may change. For example, we are moving on the surface of a sphere. So uh, from this, it again becomes clear that there is no, the gravity is not considered to be a fictitious force force as perceived by Sir Isaac Newton, but rather it is a manifestation of space-time and this curvature which is the geodesic in which an object moves is what is called gravity and this is why we call the curvature causes the gravity. We go ahead with the geodesic uh, part and we take a kind of a sphere and you can see that these two people starting from 
uh, the left and the right side, they converge at one point on the North Pole. That means we can construct a further geodesic using this sphere and you can see that it violates the normal Euclidean geometry and the parallel lines they meet. And here is another line which is called, this one is uh, basically the great circle. So these are nice illustrations just to show how geodesics uh, uh, you, you know, behave on a sphere. Again, why sphere? Because we are me measuring the movement along the surface of Earth. So the shortest path between two points in a surface is called a geodesic. And geodesics are the trajectories of the moving bodies under the influence of gravity. So here is the geodesic equation. I won't take much into deriving that. But just to tell you what are the essential components. So this part is what it measures the rate of change of the object's velocity. This one with the tau square is basically the proper time. That is the time measured by the observer who is moving. This uh, gamma symbol is basically the Christoffel symbol which has got the value of how space-time coordinates are changing due to the uh, uh, space-time curvature. If you have gone to my earlier video on black holes and time dilation, I have explained the Christoffel symbol much more in details which you can find in the uh, playlist of general relativity. And this is something which obeys the Christoffel symbol sign. So the straight line geodesic is on a, a flat surface varies on a sphere we get this kind of a curved line which is marked in red and that is why we call it gravity is not a force but just a manifestation of the structure of space time. So geodesics, yes, they are important because step by step we are moving towards the understanding of Ricci tensor. So this is what a geodesic is all about. Here is an important observation I would like to tell you that in general if we follow uh, the uh, Newton's first law of motion, then an object in rest obviously will remain at rest until there is a net force acting on it. However, on a kind of a geodesic, you see this line moving. The inertial objects remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line. And on larger scales, that is on a cosmological scale, inertial objects also follow a curved path like the orbit of the moon about the Earth, around the Earth. So this is a kind of a very important and a nice observation that how the object which is at rest, actually the inertial objects uh, moves in a kind of a geodesic on a larger scale. So uh, before we go ahead and delve deep into the uh, details of Ricci curvature tensor, the Ricci curvature tensor actually measures how a shape is deformed as it moves along the geodesics. Here I would like to give you a basic visualization and a geometrical understanding of Ricci curvature tensor. Consider these to be the curved space time and these are the curvilinear coordinates and this is from where a trajectory of a geodesic or a line starts. So it continues and it moves on and on and on until it gets at a certain point. If we take another point uh, or a, a body which is moving along this and it starts here and you see due to the curvature it somewhere deviates from each other, right? So the two initial parallel which started as parallel line geodesics will begin to deviate due to the curved space time. And this is because of the presence of the curvature the geodesic starts to deviate and you can see that the volume uh, starts changing. So here is what you can see if I, 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 uh, 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 it will come true now. If I consider a small ball and an object right at the beginning and then you uh, push that object you will see that the uh, volume is changing. So Ricci curvature describes how much the space-time volume in each direction is changing. So this is this is extremely important that how much the uh, the volume is uh, is changing. So that is the central idea of Ricci curvature. We will go more into that, but before that, this is an illustration which is going to motivate and give you a better understanding. Okay. So now that we have understood that it measures a volume change along the curvature, the question is that how does a volume change along geodesics? Now here I would like to go back a little bit and explore certain areas which are called linear transformation, volume element, area element, and lastly the most important volume form. Now if you are aware about those first three elements, then you can skip this part of the video because these are central, important, and as I have been telling that my video will be one comprehensive video 
so that you don't have to go further into understanding. So, uh, if you use a kind of a, this kind of an illustration, you can see this is B1 and B2 are a kind of a parallelogram and it has got uh, 3, 2 and minus 1, 1 as the coordinates. I'm not explaining much, it's a school level mathematics where B1 and B2, we calculate the determinant and we get 1 as the determinant of the area of a parallelogram. So, first is that area of a parallelogram can be calculated using a determinant. This is a nice and a simple example. Now we come to what we call is a linear transformation. Now, for example, here the T maps the interval 0, 1 to 0, 3 to the interval 0, 3 to 0, 3 as I will just show. Uh, this is a kind of a linear transformation where it maps from Rn to Rm and this is the, uh, this is the figure, right? So we colored the intervals 0, 1 and 0, 1. And its image, as you can see, let me show you this one and this part, right? So, with a green to red gradient that illustrates how uh, each point in the interval is mapped, T. Now, a point of an image which is colored 0, 1, 0, 1 is mapped to another point in the same color in the image 0, 3. Now, the fact is that the determinant of the matrix associated with T is 3. That means, yeah, since the determinant was uh, 3. That means that the T stretches the object so that their length is increased by a factor of 3, as you can see on the screen. So, since the determinant is positive, obviously T preserves the orientation of objects and in both the interval and its image, red points are to the right of green points. So, you can see the red points are to the right of green points. So, this is kind of a first, uh, I would say, an initial demonstration that how linear transformation takes place. So, the determinant of the matrix which is T is 3 which means that T stretches the objects so that their length is increased by a factor of 3. I hope you have got till now uh, an understanding that why I am you know measuring linear transformation. This is just to show that how in linear transformation the length gets increased by 3. Okay, let us take another example this one Tx equal to half of x. Now, as I can show you in this figure, T maps the interval 0, 1 onto the interval half of 0. So, the determinant of the matrix associated with T is half. Now, oh, okay, so this one and this one, right? Since the magnitude of this determinant is half, so T shrinks uh, uh, the objects to their original length. Yes. So, T maps the interval from here to here, it shrinks. So, the negative determinants, yeah. Uh, indicates that T reverses the orientation of objects as indicated by the colors. So, here it reverses. So, since the magnitude of this determinant is half, T shrinks half to its length and you can see negative determinants reverses the orientation, right? So, you can see here. So, which was from 0 to 1, now it is going from 0 to the left of it, that is minus 1. So, the important part of this illustration is that T reverses the direction, orientation of objects as I have shown in, in color and uh, this is uh, from this direction it goes to the opposite direction. Okay, now, uh, you know, let us take a kind of a two-dimensional linear transformation. So, what we do is that we will give this one as we all know from R2 to R2 and uh, a, on an XY plane, uh, what we are going to show is that x prime y prime plane, uh, plane equals to 2x of y. As in the uh, one dimensional case, the geometric properties of this ma mapping will be reflected in the determinant of matrix A associated with T. So, in order to better visualize, we get a, this kind of a matrix, right? And when we calculate the matrix, we get a determinant of four. So, here is a kind of a figure, right? So, the determinant uh, uh, of 4, uh, you can see here, so the mapping of 1 by 1 uh, of square area 1 is now quadruple to the area of 4. So, that is how it does, right? So, here you can see uh, that although it looks like it has uh, doubled up to 2, but this one it shows, yeah. So, from 1 it looks up to 2, but actually it has quadrupled to 4. So, what we are going to see is that the points which are here on the right gets into this direction which is points on the left. Also the points on the top goes to the points at the bottom. 
so the whole point of this illustration is that shouldn't we have got a negative determinant right because it has reversed and things have gone uh, you know uh, upside down right so uh, the points on the right have been mapped on the points of the left and the points on the top have gone to the bottom so inadvertently the question comes there shouldn't we have got the uh, negative determinant no the answer is the reason for getting a factor rather than two is due to the fact the determinant of a two by two matrices reflect area, not the length. In uh, in fact, the absolute value of the determinant of a two by two matrix is the area of a parallelogram. And here, what happens is that t stretches a one by one square area, and how much it becomes into a two by two square area, and the total value becomes four. And it has been quadrupled. So this quadrupling of the area is reflected by a determinant with magnitude 4. So this is a kind of a nice demonstration as we are going step by step. We have increased the length. Then we have reversed the direction uh, in the two-dimensional linear transformation. So what happens with three-dimensional linear transformation? So for example, we take R to R. We are mapping. And this e entire equation shows that uh, this one and if x equals to x y z then the components of the transformation so we take a uh, this kind of a uh, you know matrix and what we find is that it gets a determinant of 12 so here's the figure right so you can see here that the action of t on the unit cube if you consider 0 1 uh, it has been root that you uh, cube has been rotated and stretched into a parallelopiped now and the volume has become 12 so you can confirm that t preserved so yeah the volume has expanded to 12 so we can on confirm that the t preserved orientation uh, by comparing faces that have the same four colors you can see here the colors and check if the colors have the same order when you're moving even counterclockwise right so when you're moving counterclockwise it has the same orientation and the T is rotated the cube into a parallelopiped. Since both the cube and the parallelopiped have faces with the colors which is red, yellow, white and magenta, as one moves counterclockwise, the linear transformation here also preserves the orientation as it is must because determinant of A is positive 12. So you can change the color of the cube into a parallelopiped and T always maps and into another parallelopiped and it is a must. So here, why we have done that in order to show that in spite of the change, the orientation, etc., it preserved the orientation and it has stretched and the volume has expanded to 12. Because Ricci tensor deals with volume expansion and change of volume along geodesics, so we are doing, we are taking a baby step to understand that. So here is a summary. So what we have done till now is that we have all measured the orthonormal uh, linear transformations, the change in length, the orientation, the change in volume. However, general theory of relativity deals with non-orthonormal or arbitrary basis. So we now have to move on to the next part. So here is a spherical coordinate system we all know while this. Now from here we draw a relation, right? So x as a function of this. And what we get is x can be a function of r theta and phi. Now from here we know that we use u1, u2 and u3 as coordinate axis and we can use r equals to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus y z squared which gives r equals to r is a function of x, y, z. And now what we do is that we set this to x is equal to x is a function of u1, u2, u3, y is a function of y, u1, u2, u3 and also is the z. So we call this as transformation equations. Why we call this transformation equations, it will soon become clear when we start, you know, uh, pointing the values. So if u1 equals to u, u1 of x, y, z, u2 and u3, and then this part is actually the coordinate axis in the chosen system that corresponds to the x, y, z of the Cartesian and r theta and phi in a spherical coordinate system. This is something a kind of relation that we have drawn uh, just to uh, demonstrate that how we are moving from spherical 
and Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, so here we are going to calculate or get a quick understanding of what is a volume element or what is an area element. Now you see this is a kind of an infinite symbol uh, cube or you can call it a parallel pipette. And here is the differential length DL1, this is DL2 and this is DL3. Right, so uh, what we do is that in Cartesian coordinate system the lengths we measure, the differential lengths can be dx, dy, dz. Here it is DL1, DL2, DL3 but in some uh, uh, curvilinear system the differential change, uh, changes are not length based such as d theta and d phi. So what we do is that in order to calculate a differential volume in general for example a cube or anything what we do length into breadth so we have done that same way dl1 dl2 dl3 and what we now need is a kind of a conversion factor which will multiply or take dl into i times dl or i times h times i times du. So what we do is that we use dl1 equal to h1 du1, h2 du2, h3 du3 where h is a scaling factor and these are the differential lengths, right? And what we get is that we can rearrange this and we get dv equals to this and then putting all the h together I get this which is a volume element. Nothing much I mean to say this is just a kind of a a uh, quick brush over on what is a volume element, what is an area element. Okay, now if we want to calculate the area of this uh, red one, which is on the extreme left hand side, this is DL1, DL2, DL3. So the differential area would be DL1 multiplied by DL3, and we know DA equals to this one. So what we get is DA is equal to this, and this is called the area element. So these are just a kind of a, as I told you, you can skip it over, nothing much, it's just, you know, uh, getting over certain areas which are important in terms of our understanding. Okay, now we come into the most important part, what is called a volume form. Now volume form is, a, uh, we can call it, it is a differential form of degree equal to the differentiable manifold dimension equal to the differential manifold. I will explain you in uh, quickly uh, in a very simple terms. So uh, the a volume form you can talk it as a special differential form defined on an oriented Riemannian manifolds and it introduces a natural concept of measurement on the manifold. Forget for the time being what is a differential form, forget for the time being what is a oriented or a non-oriented Riemann manifold just understand that volume form is a kind of a differential form which introduces a natural concept of measurement. So if this M is a manifold and it has got N dimension, then the volume form will also have an N dimension. That's it. I am to say uh, nothing more than that. So here we get what is called MNG and this is the M is a smooth manifold. This is the dimension. This is the Riemannian metric and we use the omega sign to denote what is called a volume form and for the time being we are discarding orientability differential manifold because again it will take a lot of time to explain this concept just to understand it provides a mean to define the integral of a function on a differentiable manifold. Okay, so now it will become easier for you to understand because this will elaborate the definition in a mathematical form. So let us assume that M and G is a smooth oriented manifold, I mean to say a Riemannian manifold N with a Riemannian metric and for, uh, uh, okay, so for a point P and M, so let this uh, be the volume form on M. Now let us recall that it is defined as follows for point P which is a member of the manifold M. Uh, what I would do is that I will assume E1 to En to be a positive orthonormal basis on T sub P M, right? And then what we do is that we calculate this one. Now we are calculating the volume for volume form, right? The omega uh, P is E1, E2, which is we are using it in terms of exterior product, the another pro uh, positive orthonormal basis. So what we get is that uh, the uh, uh, from here we get uh, yeah, another problem. So TPM then equals to this. 
So this becomes the determinant matrix, that is the determinant of the matrix. A becomes the transition matrix and this is the dot product as we know. So now, since the, both the bases are orthonormal, so hence the determinant of the matrix we can consider as plus minus uh, 1. And since both bases are posi positive, A is uh, greater than 0 and hence determinant is equals to A and therefore this becomes true. Right. So, so, so this is basically a kind of an elaborate and a much more easier definition of what is a volume form. Okay, the question is that why do we need a volume form? Now you see that in linear transformation or in the differential area, whatever we are calculating, uh, we are not getting a tensor because we need a tensor. As we have been explaining, the need for tensor in general relativity is important. So we need to find out mathematical framework which is a tensor. Okay, so the volume form is a special differential form. We have uh, covered this this definition. It is introduces a natural concept of on the manifold and it is a tensor. So for orthonormal basis, if we take the omega and we take a, this kind of an axis where E1 and E2, then the volume form is just E1 comma E2 and this is a kind of a square which has a volume 1. Now if you take a kind of a another, uh, another uh, axis which is E1, E2 and E3, and we take a kind of a cube like this, then also the volume form will be E1, E2 and E3. So this is just a kind of an initial, just a basic idea of how we calculate volume form. Okay, so we have known this as the volume form. Now, for example, uh, now for example, we take a kind of a parallelogram and we take two vectors A and B, mind it. We are taking two vectors A and B. So how do we calculate the volume form? So the first thing what we will do as usual is that we will break this up into components. So once we break it up, we get A1, E1, A2, E2 and the B vector, we get B1, E1 and B2, E2. Simple. Now what the volume form we know is omega A, uh, B. So uh, this actually becomes a kind of a linear map. And what we get from here is this. Because we know that a change in volume from a first question linear algebra that a change in volume is given by the determinant of the matrix. So here it is that volume form equals to uh, the A, B equals to the determinant of the matrix. So this actually shows that if you want to calculate a volume form uh, into a kind of a, a matrix, then how do we do that? So we take the determinant and then we get the volume form. Okay, so we go ahead with this kind of a volume form in orthonormal basis. We have broken it up into vectors and this is the one. Uh, we get the determinant and how do we calculate the determinant? Nothing great to tell. We all know how do we do. So we get this. Now, we can better write this particular determinant or I would say, yeah, the determinant of the matrix in what is called is an epsilon format, which we call is the levi chibita symbol. Now, levi chivita symbol is nothing, uh, which is actually a nice way of writing things. However, levi chivita symbol has been defined as plus, minus and zero. So, if I and J varies from 1 to 2, it is plus 1. If it is 2 to 1, it is minus 1. And if I equals to J, then it will become equal to zero. So, now we take a kind of a volume form uh, in this kind of a cube. And we take this vector A pointing in this direction, B pointing in this direction and C pointing in this direction. And we break up again the components, this time into three dimension. And then again we calculate the volume form and we take the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix. And again we can now take, now we can take the, uh, what we call the three dimension of the levi chivita symbol and we get the volume form in this way. However, the levi chivita symbol, remember, in three dimension is a little bit complicated. It is this, right? So what we now tell is that for the indices i, j, k in the uh, in uh, for values occurring for one, two, three, and this one, which is the yellow circle, uh, is in the cyclic order one, two, three, which corresponds to obviously plus. And uh, if you take uh, uh, in the red direction, that is the reversing cyclic order. 
then this will correspond to 0 as we have the Levy Chidra symbol will be minus 1 and otherwise it would be 0. So again repeating that IJK which is the Levy Chibita symbol a nice way of uh, representing the matrix. Now if it is occurring in 1, 2, 3 that is the positive direction of yellow it will be plus 1. It is occurring in this red direction 1 and then 2 and 3 in the, uh, uh, in the, in the anticlockwise direction it would be reversing and it will be minus 1 otherwise it is 0. So what we can tell is that Levi Chivita symbol is actually a nice way of getting the volume of shapes created by vectors. Okay, now that we have been dealing with orthonormal and orthonormal basis, what about if we create a volume which is in non-orthonormal basis? Whenever we think of non-orthonormal basis, let us go back to this kind of a, 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 a illustration which we showed that the basis of the vectors, remember, they are not parallel to each other, so we cannot write it as a simple dot product. So we introduce the concept of metric tensor. However, this is just to make you a visualization that it is in non-orthonormal how the vectors look like. So we get this one. Okay. Uh, now what we do is that we, we we extend the E1 basis vector to E1 prime to E1 tilde, and it increases the size. And the E2, it reduces the size to E2 tilde. Now, if you have observed my video earlier on tensor analysis in the tensor analysis uh, uh, playlist, you will see that we have used something which we call a forward uh, transformation of matrix and backward transformation of matrix. Anyway, you don't have to worry about it. The forward transformation matrix or uh, calculation involves that when the basis of the vector increases and we are moving towards that, right? So if we take the forward transformation matrix, then it should have some kind of a value. Obviously, the matrix kind of it should have some kind of a value, and we are not dealing with backward. However, backward transformation also will have some kind of a value. So the forward transformation has been used by the coefficient f, and this one will put into this. So uh, this is just to demonstrate that because we are using forward transformation, that means we are moving forward, that means we are changing the basis, we are changing the coordinate, then it, we will use f as the coefficient. So now what we get is that if we deal with curvilinear coordinates, here it is, right? So volume uh, in the curvilinear coordinates, uh, where the basis vectors, here are the basis vectors, they are all partial der derivatives. Then the volume change that we get from the old basis to the new basis we get is this one and this, which we call as the Jacobian. So if we are dealing with curvilinear coordinates, remember that the basis vectors are all partial derivatives. Then the volume change will be calculated in terms of the old to new basis, which is also called the Jacobian. Okay, so. Now, if we take the volume change in non-orthonormal, summarize, so we got this one, we got this one, and also we have got this one. So first one was quite easy, second one is called the forward transformation, third one is the curvilinear Jacobian matrix, uh, Jacobian determinant. So these are, just to show you, these are the three ways in which we, in which we uh, express the volume created by vectors. The first one, the second one, and the third, the Jacobian. Okay, so now we, we already know that the metric tensor that we get is basically a dot product of the two bases. Now, if we get g tilde ij, now g tilde ij is nothing that is the new metric tensor. The components of the metric tensor is just that if we have taken the new basis of the metric tensor. And if we, yeah, so this is the new basis. And if we go on calculating this, I have just omitted because otherwise it would be too long, we get this, uh, this one, which is a g tilde ij. And after, as you see, that I have been talking about f as the forward transformation. For the time being, you can just visualize f as a change in coordinate, a change in basis, we are moving forward. So what we get is that the components of the metric tensor is just the dot product of the basis of vectors, which we have seen. If you expand the new basis to old basis, these are the components of the metric tensor in the old basis. So now if we take this one and this one, so you can see that this is the determinant f, 
this is also the determinant f and this is the determinant g and remember that determinant of g that is the metric tensor is a unique metric uh, unit matrix so it will become 1 so it will become the determinant of f squared so this is what actually denotes that we must note that the change in volume is not only because of the determinant of f but it is also we can calculate the square root of the determinant of g that is the uh, volume change is due to the determinant of f but also it is equal to the square root of the determinant of the metric tensor of the new basis how will you identify the new basis simple when there is a tilde there is a new basis when there is no tilde tilde that is an old basis you can look more into my videos on tensor analysis i have dealt a lot of videos covering the old and the new basis okay so in the same way if you go to the curvilinear coordinates we get something like this and if you get this we also get the determinant of j determinant of j and this is the old basis that the determinant of g this is also unit unit matrix so this was also lead to this and we can call the change in volume is not only the determinant of forward matrix but also the determinant of the metric tensor of the new basis because there is a tilde okay now suppose we have two vectors a and b written in terms of the uh, i would say in terms of the basis which is not orthonormal and e1 and e2 are the tilde so the how do we calculate the volume for volume uh, part so the volume form we will we'll have to break up into two components because the two dimension we break it up and now you see the volume formula it has now got two parts right first is this part the square root of the determinant of the metric tensor component g this actually takes care of moving from orthonormal to not orthonormal remember that in the arbitrary basis we are taking care of the non orthonormal part so this is the non orthonormal this is the which which is not the uh, usual uh, no, or normal part this is the non orthonormal part this part actually takes care of the curvilinear coordinates uh, this one the new the, the, the new basis right so this part takes care of the new basis and we write it in this way and what do we get this part is actually the components of the volume form so this is a nice way in which we explain i would say the 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 volume in arbitrary basis from orthonormal we are moving to non orthonormal the square root of the determinant of the metric tensor g takes care of moving from orthonormal this takes care of determinant takes care of the new basis of the basis vectors e1 e2 tilde and then we get the final which is the volume form followed by the square root of the determinant of g and the levita civita levi civita symbols in two dimension which are actually the components of the volume form so in an orthonormal basis levi civita symbol gives the components of the volume form in an arbitrary basis this also gives the volume form and finally we get to this okay so this is you can just take a snapshot of that before we move away this is how we calculate in a non orthonormal basis now in order to avoid further uh, any uh, derivation of the ricci curvature tensor we assume that let us first of all assume this one so here this is the entire volume or the v part of the shape that we have been talking which has been created by vectors right and this part is basically you will see it is the product of all separation vectors from i to d i have used s and you can use anything we will see what is a separation vector in a few minutes from now so here you see u j uh, sorry mu j and mu j on the top and the bottom gets cancelled and this is the riemann curvature tensor and we get onto this so what happens is that this dx and dz transforms as it is and the mu part uh, mu j part gets cancelled and x and z gets transformed right at the uh, bottom and this is actually the product of the this is actually the volume that we are talking about and this is actually the ricci curvature tensor now i would just like to tell you in certain cases you might find that the ricci curvature tensor is used with a plus form this is just a kind of a convention nothing much uh, to worry about so we can tell that the volume form in orthonormal basis looks like this i am taking three variables just to make it uh, clear and volume form in non orthonormal basis or arbitrary 
this is looks like this. This is the Ricci curvature tensor. This is the volume form. And finally, what we can say is that Ricci tensor measures the change of volume along geodesics. So this is how the Ricci tensor and the mathematics of Ricci tensor comes into uh, play. I hope that uh, till now things are quite clear. Okay, now I need to explain to you before we go to geodesics a little bit about parallel transport and covariant derivative. Now, when we talk of parallel transport, we are trying to compare two vectors. Now, how do we know each one vector is bigger or smaller than other? We just have to put one vector over the other. If both of them are the same, they are the same. Here you can see this one is bigger and this one is smaller. So, it is a way of comparing vectors at different positions. It's a way of transporting data along smooth manifold. So, here is a triangle. I get a kind of a, a point. Uh, red one and I get a vector which is pointing yellow and I have to move parallelly. So I just keep the direction same and here and then I come back here and then when I come back on this this one you see the this one this uh, black one what we find is that in flat space the parallel transport of a vector it comes back to the original position so there is no change but it is not in case of a sphere. So if I am standing here on the top with a red on the on the on the red part and i want to move to the blue part here and if i have got this same yellow vector and i'm trying to point this vector and keep it as straight as possible i name the vector as v so i move here i move here and then i come here so the entire change in the direction of the vector is because of this the curvature i try to move along this line also so i move into this this and this so the direction of the vector changes due to the curvature now from here I want to move straight up to the red point, try to keep it as same as possible and here I come and you see that the, the, the V prime vector which is coming to an end is not the same vector, it is, it is something which has changed. So if I take out these two vectors and we get a significant amount of difference and that is what the Riemann curvature tensor does. So the Riemann curvature tensor describes the change of the components in the space time direction this is the one is the riemann curvature tensor don't worry you're not dealing with riemann curvature but because riemann curvature and parallel transport are related to each other so this is why it is important it gives a complete description of the tidal forces how it is related to general relativity so a few important points uh, we try to parallelly transport keeping the vector as straight as possible but we cannot do that Parallel transport cannot be keeps constant. Here we introduce a new concept which is called covariant derivative. So the covariant derivative earlier in my video I have shown nabla uv but to keep things simple I am using vv. So this is the direction, this is the vector field and this is the rate of change of a vector field. So what is the covariant derivative? Covariant derivative is a tool which helps us to find parallel transported vector fields. We will soon use covariant derivative. So that is the reason I just uh, wanted to give you a glimpse of what is a covariant derivative. So just to summarize, parallel transport cannot keep vector constant. It is impossible to define a constant vector field and uh, parallel transport keeps vectors as we can uh, move step by step. In flat space, covariant derivative is just the ordinary derivative, but covariant derivative helps to find that parallel transported fields. So Covariant derivative is a tool or it is a generalization of the directional derivative of vector calculus. So here you see if the result is zero, that means the vector v has been transported in the direction v. It is not w, I apologize, it should be v. So here is the change of volume around geodesic. So this part I hope is clear. So parallel transport, if I go back, is something which is a tool which will help to uh, calculate the derivative because we cannot take the ordinary derivative here because we are dealing with curved space time. So here is a, a sphere and you can see these two persons again meeting at a point but here is again a sphere. These are the red points which are meeting at point and you see if I calculate the volume uh, take a, a, a ball or a, yeah it's a ball and then we uh, the, the it shrinks it shrinks and it further shrinks. So this shrinking is being taken care by this one. So the ball shrinks in size as it moves along the geodesic 
which means it has a positive curvature. Okay, so here is a set of geodesic uh, uh, curves, and what we are now doing is that we are taking care of what is called a sectional vector. Okay, so we care, we take care, and we I have deliberately used is as as vec, right? So, uh, so this is called what is called as a separation uh, vector. So I have used the term as vec in order to uh, give it a little bit. You will understand why. So the separation vector. Now we we move with the basic first equation of geodesic deviation, as we have seen that uh, just a few minutes back. So this means that the geodesic has been parallelly transported. Now what I do is that I take a second derivative. This one I am second taking a second covariant derivative of the separation vector. Remember that in this type of a scenario, curvilinear, we cannot take an ordinary derivative, so we are using a second covariant derivative, which will yield to this result. Right, and you can see here what we have done is that this one is actually the Ricci curvature tensor. Okay, we have uh, I have just uh, swapped the vectors to keep uh, in the torsion factor free. Uh, so this one, when I move the this entire Ricci curvature tensor as vec b v on the uh, other side, automatically it becomes negative. So what we can say this part is basically what is called the geodesic deviation. That means that if we take the second derivative of the separation vector, it yields to reach a geodesic deviation, and this one is called basically the Riemann tensor. So this is basically what is called the Riemann tensor. So we have taken the second covariant derivative of the separation vector, and we have what we have got is the Riemann tensor. So if we get the parallel lines, we got the separation vector. Equals to zero, and we get the uh, Riemann uh, uh, Riemann tensor also equals to zero. And if you get something which are converging, we get the separation vector less. Uh, the Riemann tensor is greater than zero, so that means that the dot product should be less than zero. And if we get uh, this kind of a derivative, uh, um, this kind of a separation vector where the vectors are you know uh, what we call diverging, then we get the dot product. Would be greater than zero, and the Riemann tensor dot product would be less than zero. So this is nice. This is quite easy. This is a kind of a nice illustration of the separation vector being parallel equals to zero, uh, converging. The uh, Riemann tensor is greater than zero. There is a sectional vector. Uh, the uh, separation vector is less than zero. For the diverging, we say that the Riemann tensor is negative or less than zero. There is a separation vector. The dot product would be greater than zero. So now what we do is that we come to the last part of uh, the video, and what we are going to learn a little bit is about what is a sectional curvature. Now, a sectional curvature actually is a metric structure on a Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian manifold, and is entirely dependent, uh, determined by the metric tensor, which is a metric rep representation. So we can say that in Riemannian geometry, the sectional curvature is one of the ways. Is one of the ways uh, to describe the curvature if the dimension is greater than one. This is how the sectional curvature looks like. This is the Riemann curvature tensor. This is the sectional curvature, usually denoted by K, and this is the sign convention. Sign convention means that whether it will be positive, that is, it is uh, uh, converging; whether it will be negative, that is, diverging; or whether it will be zero, that it, it is parallel. So here is a kind of a illustration. Uh, here is a ball, and this are the you know called the sectional curvature. And when the ball moves, we get the same volume. So the sectional curvature is zero, and we call the Ricci curvature is also equals to zero. So when we got the size of the ball remains the same. However, this kind of a geodesic, where you get the ball and I move and I move, you see the size of the ball shrinks. So we get a kind of a positive uh, Ricci curvature. And the size of the ball shrinks. Whereas this one, if, if I get a ball and I move and I move, you see the size or the volume of the ball is increasing. So sectional curvature is less than zero. The Ricci curvature is also less than zero. So this is the kind of a nice illustration, a nice, I would say, a visualization. More important than the mathematics, how the volume of the geodesics 
or how the volume of any ball is changing. So ball obviously moves in a geodesic pattern. So it it is it is this is how it happens. Size of the ball increases. So one way of calling it it is very gross mind it is not strictly mathematical is that the sectional curvature is a kind uh, I would say the Ricci curvature is a kind of a summation of sectional curvature. So in here also it is a kind of a summation and here there is diverging it has got a summation. Again this is a wrong way of uh, denoting the sectional curvature. I have just used it in a gross way uh, because I want to really avoid those complex uh, notations so that you can understand. So the Ricci curvature is a kind of a summation which is the sigma of the all the points of the sectional curvature which will denote the curvature and the movement of any particle along the geodesics and the change in the volume. Okay, so we have come finally to end of the video. So we have learned about the components of Einstein field equation. Most importantly, an intuitive way, why do we measure spherical objects? Because these are how things happen and we have seen that Einstein field equation doesn't really carry much of a meaning in case we are measuring things in a, a small fashion. We have understood the role of tensors, what is a geodesic, how volume changes along geodesics, what are the linear transformations, understanding volume management, a lot about volume form in orthonormal and non-orthonormal basis as well as the parallel transport and the covariant derivative. Finally, we have also covered the sectional curvature. So this is a kind of a summary of this video. In the next video, I am going to cover up what is a Ricci tensor in terms of Christoffel symbols. I am also going to learn, uh, tell you about what are the properties of Ricci tensor. We are also going to calculate Ricci tensor from the metric which includes certain examples and the Ricci tensor from the Schwarzschild metric, from the Robertson Walker metric, and from the Reasoner Nordstrom metric. So, I know that video has been a little bit long because I need to cover up all the details of the Ricci curvature tensor. Do let me know about your comment. Uh, do like, subscribe, and click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. My earnest endeavor has been to bring up complex topics in a much more easier manner. Thank you for watching this video. Do let me know your comments and I will be soon back with a new video on general relativity and other subjects. Till then, wish you all the best, best wishes and a happy weekend ahead. This is Sean of signing off from Physics for Students, wishing you a great weekend and a happy weekend and a healthy life all the way through. Thank you very much for watching. Now, you can be a part of our team. You can send your scientific articles, essays, research papers, lesson plans on a particular subject of science. For further details, please write to us at editor at physicsforstudents.com. Stay safe and happy.